Chapter 8 covers what we previewed in the last chapter, namely, how do competitors behave in different industry types? The three we're going to look at specifically are competitive, monopolistic, and monopolistically competitive. The one we're not covering today, but we'll cover in our next chapter, is oligopolies. The headline deals with McDonald's. No, not their hamburgers or french fries. It's their coffee. In the late 2000s, they rolled out McCafe. And this was during a tough time in terms of the economy. So people were wondering, why did they do that? And it turns out it was a very smart move. They tripled their amount of coffee sales as a market share. And then they also made a big move competitively. So why was this a good move? We're going to see later that if you understand the nature of their industry, you'll understand exactly why they did that. The learning objectives today are, first, there's some generalized items that we're going to cover, namely the firm bases their decisions on marginal revenues and marginal cost, and they will keep adding quantity until those equal. Next, that the profit equals the price minus the average total cost times the quantity sold. And furthermore, there's entry for incentive into an industry so long as a firm's marginal revenue is greater than their marginal cost and only in perfect competition is maximum social benefit achieved. Now, more specifically into perfect competition, we'll look at the characteristics, the price and quantity setting for a perfectly competitive industry, then short-term output decisions by individual competitors, and then looking at profit or loss conditions for a firm, which leads to the market supply curve, entry and exit by firms, and ultimately the long run price and output for the perfectly competitive industry. The second industry type we'll look at is monopolies. And in monopolistic markets, we'll again look at the characteristics, what are the sources of the monopoly power, and how are price and quantity set for monopolies, which is quite different from perfect competition. And then look at the demand and supply of a monopoly, their profits, what happens in a multi-plant decision for a monopoly, and then look at what we call dead weight loss of monopoly, which is really robbing society of some potential benefit. And the third is monopolistically competitive. And what are the characteristics of this type? How do we maximize profit if you're a firm inside this type of industry? What leads to entry and exit of competition? And again, long run equilibrium. And why in this particular type, we see quite a bit of product differentiation and innovation. Perfect competition is characterized by an interaction between buyers and sellers that are many in number. No one seller can influence the market by itself. Each firm in the market has a homogeneous identical product. Think of this as a pure commodity with no differentiation. Buyers and sellers have perfect information, so you can't trade on that or take advantage from that. And there are no transaction costs, so that this is a frictionless environment. Furthermore, their companies are free to exit and enter this market. The implications of these conditions are, there's a single market price set by the market demand and market supply. No one player sets it. And finally, firms earn zero economic profits in the long run. What do we mean by economic profit? It means that the average total cost equals the total revenue. In other words, they're just making it, right? That's the nature of perfect competition. Let's start with a brief refresher of supply and demand. You recall this graph. And here we see that price is set by the interaction of market supply and market demand. Again, in perfect competition, no one player dominates the establishment of the price. Therefore, the market sets the price. In this case, then, if you're the firm, you do not see any sloping curves. You see one price because you are undifferentiated from all the other players. So you're gonna accept the market price. So the line for price is actually a flat or horizontal line. Price is determined by the market, not any one firm, and therefore the firm sees a fixed price. The short run is a period of time over which some factors of production are fixed, such as rent or equipment. To maximize the short-term profits then, we look at the fixed cost as a given, and then we look at our cost in terms of ver variable or marginal cost to make our output decisions. As mentioned earlier, the firm's demand curve is quite unique because the price is already set. So the demand is almost limitless, but what you're constrained by is your cost structure relative to that price. It, so a firm will look at the uh, demand curve that equals the price, which equals their marginal revenue. 
it's the same for, for all points in quantity because the price is the same at any quantity. So that's why all these are equal. Here is a depiction of how this looks for a firm. A firm in a perfectly competitive market sees revenue that's a straight line from the origin. So there's a constant slope because the price doesn't change. However, their costs do change. So there are some periods in which they can't compete. There's too low a quantity and it's too high cost to supply such a small number. However, at certain points, we start seeing the effects of scale and also that there's a sweet spot, if you will, where your marginal costs are behaving nicely, where you can make some money. But at some point, the quantity rising is such that your marginal costs start increasing. We see diminishing returns in that regard. So we see a curve for the cost line compared to the straight line we see for the price. A represents the point at which you'd start considering selling some products because below that your costs are greater than your revenue. And at point B, you exit because your costs are greater than revenue. Now you don't want to be at either one of these points. Where you want to be is where the slope of the cost curve equals the slope of your revenues, namely your price. And that is the point at which you maximize your profits. So that is how firms decide on the quantity that they will produce. Next, we'll look at profit maximization for a firm under perfect competition. Assume this is what the firm is facing, a price that's fixed. That's why it's a horizontal line and marginal cost that drops as quantity increases. But at some point, marginal costs rise and then average total cost, which includes both the fixed cost and the variable cost having this shape curve. In this scenario, the quantity produced by the firm is where marginal cost equals marginal revenue, because before that point, they are still making money with more production. Beyond that point, with each successive unit they make, they will be losing money. So the equilibrium for a specific firm is where their marginal cost equals marginal revenue. So this rectangle represents the revenue because price times quantity is revenue. If we look at the average total cost at that quantity, we see this point here. And the next box, this rectangle here represents profit because the revenue is determined by this line. The costs are based on this line. This bottom rectangle represents the cost. So this section represents profit. So the optimal quantity for a firm is where marginal revenue equals marginal costs and profit equals the price minus the average total cost at equilibrium quantities times the quantity also at equilibrium. So that's the profit. So we've seen this in graphical form. And I hope it makes sense to you just looking at how the, the curves interact. But let's do some with numbers. Here is a cost function for a firm. Cost a given quantity equals five plus Q to the second power. And the firm is in a perfectly competitive market and the price is set at $20. For question one, what price should the manager charge in this firm? Second is what is level the output should be to maximize profits? And finally, what is the amount of profits earned? First is an easy one. You have no choice. The market sets the price. You accept the price of 20. Next, since marginal cost equals 2Q, you notice that the cost in total is 5 plus Q squared. So marginal cost, again, our friend, the first derivative is 2Q. So if 2Q is the marginal cost and 20 is the marginal revenue, we could set those equal to each other and Q then equals 10 at equilibrium. So the maximum profits are the revenue, which is price times quantity, 20 times 10, minus the cost, which is 5 plus Q squared or 5 plus 10 squared. The resulting calculation leads to $95 maximum profit for this firm. We'll next look at short run cost minimization. We've already seen that marginal revenue and marginal cost determine the quantity that we will supply. However, what if we then consider the different positions where the average total cost and the average variable cost may occur? We're going to see something not very pleasant here. We see that the marginal revenue is this horizontal line, and yet the average total cost curve is above the marginal revenue line, which means your, your costs are greater than your revenue. Specifically, this box here, the bottom one, is the revenue. This box here, the taller one, are your cost, and therefore we have a loss. In this condition, 
we have a loss equal to the difference between the average total cost and the price times the quantity. However, the slight silver lining is our average variable cost is still low. So in this case, we are better off, strangely it may seem, still being in production because as long as we're producing at Q star, at least we're paying some of our fixed costs. And that is the condition of this scenario where we have a loss, but the loss is such that each sale we make can defray some of our fixed costs, even though we're not profit on an overall basis. What is the second situation? Here is the marginal cost, here are the curves, but notice in this case, the average variable cost is also above marginal revenue. Now we're in trouble because we have loss based on fixed costs and loss based on the gap between our variable cost and our mar uh, marginal revenue. So therefore we have double trouble. We have fixed cost losses and the negative profit margin. So the loss that we shut down, we can minimize uh, we can minimize some of our fixed costs in that scenario. However, in this case, adding quantity does not reduce or pay off any of our variable costs. Therefore, this is a shutdown scenario where both the average variable costs and the average total costs are greater than the marginal revenue. You can minimize loss by shutting down. Short run output decisions in this scenario then are to maximize short-term profits, the perfectly competitive firm will operate where price equals marginal cost, provided that price is greater than or equal to average variable cost. In the case where the price is less than the average variable cost, then the firm should shut it down because there is no optimal position in remaining in that business. Now we can look at a short-run firm's decisions and how that aggregates into industry supply curve. This is going to look fairly similar to what we did previously with aggregating demand. Now let's derive an individual firm's supply curve. At what quantities would they be willing to supply and where does it end? Let's say this is the cost faced by a firm. They have marginal and average cost functions as follows. Now we see that if the price is where the marginal cost and average cost intersect, that's the point at which they start making money. So in this, in this case, we want to have nothing below Q sub zero. So we'll start supplying. Next, look at Q1. We'll continue to supply Q1 because the price is higher than our average variable cost. So we're in a profit scenario. So if we draw a line at what is the price, because price in perfect competition is a straight line, it is equal to the slope that is defined by these two points. So an individual supply would go where the average variable cost and marginal cost intersect. Now that's for one firm, let's call it MCI. And as we aggregate across, we see that we can get to a market supply curve. We aggregate in this scenario, 500 firms, we'll get to a market supply curve because the market is comprised of say the 500 firms. Similar to what we did with demand, where a demand is comprised of a number of consumers in the market. In the long run, what happens? Well, we have supply and demand defining the price. So we're, we're starting off with marginal revenue for a firm. Now, if there's a competitor that has a lower marginal cost than marginal revenue, they have incentive to enter because they can enter and make profit, right? Because if they have lower costs than the price, they can enter and make money. This would drive up the supply curve, which would drive down the price increasing quantity and driving down price. Now at some point, a firm now is in trouble because the price has dropped to a point where it is now less than their marginal cost. They need to exit. So one scenario in this one here, where a firm has lower marginal cost than margin revenue, they have incentive to enter. Next is a scenario where it's the other side, where your marginal costs are greater and therefore you exit. If you exit then supply in the industry will then drop thereby increasing the price and reducing the quantity. So the market is finding its equilibrium. This is another uh, example of the invisible hand where if there's too much profit in the industry, competition will enter. If the prices are driven down to the point where there are losses, then there will be exits and the price will rise until we get to market equilibrium. 
In the long run, what happens? Well, in the long run, we reach this point where the marginal cost equals the average cost, which equals the price, and that is long run equilibrium. Because at that point, there's no incentive to enter or exit. There's no competitor or no firm that is losing money because their average costs are equal to the price. There's also no firm that could enter and dramatically change the price because all, we all have the same cost structure. So therefore, there's no entry or exit and we are long run equilibrium. So in the long run, the marginal cost equals the average cost, which equals the marginal revenue or the price. Stated more precisely, price equals marginal cost, and price is also equal to the minimum of the average cost. That means there's no incentive to move beyond that point. 